<laughs> Welcome to episode four of the Anarchy Roundtable. I'm Joe. I'm Mike. I'm Dan. Ken. Have you ever watched uh, Dictator, the movie? Yes. Uh, no. There's a great scene where the, the, the lead actress says, um, I'm totally not racist. I haven't had a white boyfriend in five years. <laughs> 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 well, what I like in that movie, there's um, he says something like the dictator says something to her along the lines of like, "You seem educated. That's really adorable for us men. It's like watching a chimp on on skates. It means <laughs> it means nothing to women, but it's adorable to us." <laughs> <laughs> educated person running a a vegan food place. I love when he calls the black the sub-Saharan. I've said that at work. <laughs> I, I don't even get that reference. Sub-Saharans? Yeah, I don't even know what that Because means. Africans that are north of the Saharan the aren't black. They're like a different race. There's multiple like different Arabic. races in well, yeah, okay. Africa. And even, even black people are multiple different races. The moment you Hold start on. throwing geography at me, you lost me. Yeah. I so, was really amazed years ago when my friend... When I heard the whole like light skin dark dark skin thing, I didn't know there was really. I didn't know there was a difference, or there should be. Well, you know, Africa is actually a lot larger than it shows up on the map too. So I mean, it's there's a lot that we don't know about yeah. different places around the world because we're so brainwashed. I, I'm fairly sure Africa is like this big on the map, but it's really actually like this big in scale. Well, because the um, equator goes through it, and in order to make a map that's flat. They have to stretch out the northern and southern latitudes in order to um, yep. make Also, there's actual scientific so reason for it. Scientific well, it's, it's racism a, is what you're a, saying. Um, oh my God, don't turn me into a feminist now. <laughs> I had no idea what I was saying. It's not scientific really science. racism. It, it's not science. It's just that. cartography or it's whatever. Oh, it's cartographic racism. racism. Yeah. <laughs> planet's racist it, i mean if you look greenland looks like it's the size of the united states but it's it's not it's, um, really yeah i don't I know what to go get my globe i didn't know all this shit well, when you look on a globe greenland is not stretched out because it's a globe it's I when you look globe. on a flat map that it's like that so yeah, if you look a at a globe for the curvature of the Earth. yeah if you look at a globe you're seeing it to scale so okay. yeah so yeah, i learned something today <laughs> Yeah, so I am going to bring this up, um, even though you guys didn't watch the uh, or listen to the podcast. Sorry, I forgot my whole um, I did. Tom, you did listen <laughs> oh, to good. it. Which one? Tom Woods, no. episode, what, 547 or whatever? I think it was 547. I don't really listen to Tom Woods. He had Stephen, I know, but I put it a link in the in the, um, the invite. I do like Stephen Kinsella, and I like yeah, Tom yeah. Woods, too. He had Stephen Kinsella on, and they were talking about contracts, and contracts in a, you know, they call it libertarian, but really they mean anarchist. And yeah, anarchist society, and they, were, you know, well, anarchist Kinsella, society is follows under the umbrella of a libertarian yeah, society. Yeah. He is a patent attorney and an anarchist. You know, so pretty intelligent guy. He's got a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah, and he, they were talking about contracts, and the one little tiny part of it that kind of interests me was um, they were talking about a breach of a contract and under some people's theory the idea is a breach of contract is a form of theft and I was I kind of I didn't know that this was something that people had said before it was just something that I would worked out in my own mind well that would seem to make sense so yeah um, and, and the idea that it's theft is let's say um, let's say you're a plumber and you go and you do work for somebody and then they don't pay you, but you have a contract. Um, oh, wait, no, no. Forget the plumber one. Let's say you borrow money. That, that was the example that he used. That this, this one makes more sense. So you borrow money from somebody and then you spend it because that's why you borrowed it. And then two years later, you're supposed to pay it back with some interest. Um, if you don't pay it back, in my mind, before that was theft. But um, 
what Stefan was saying is that you've you've really got two different agreement. You have an agreement for two different property transfers. First drop property transfer is the person loans you money. You take possession of that money. And at that point, you own that money. It's yours to spend on the thing that you you agreed to buy with it. Um, then later on, there's another part of the agreement that says you will give new money, new property that didn't exist at the time of the first transfer because you agree you're going to spend that money. It was yours. It no longer exists. So at the end, you agree to transfer this property that's going to exist in the future back to the person who lent the money to you. Or it's not even back at this point. You're transferring it to them because it's not it's not back because it's different property. Right. Um, he's saying if that property doesn't exist at the end of the term of your loan, then you couldn't have stolen it because it doesn't exist. So if you don't have the money, then it's not theft. What is it? It's deception. Well, it's not deception because you, you fully Fraud. intended to pay it back. So then, okay, so now you bring some complexity into it. A, you know, like, what if you do have the money? What if you never intended to pay it back? There's all kinds of things that they didn't go into in the video. So that's... What if, you know, you get hit by a car and you're quadriplegic and you can't pay it back? Right. So should you feel sorry for the person? Well, it's not just that you can't pay it back. It's you don't have the money. Therefore, the property you agreed to transfer doesn't exist. I think that's overcomplicating a very simple situation because you're not necessarily lending them the money. Money's worthless. Right, you're lending them the receipt for your labor. You are lending them your time. They are meant to pay you back value, yeah. regardless of what currency you lent with the interest. So saying you don't have the money, so oh, I don't have to give it back. Of course, you still have to give it back, and you're in debt now. I mean, and you can't call it theft, no, because of course right. theft is intentional. You can't accidentally steal something. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you could accidentally steal something. But that's not really theft. That's more like oh shit, it's stuck to my coat. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> but you know they they have to pay it back in some way. I'm, it, it doesn't seem like you just say, "Oh, sorry, see ya." And I guess that's why we have credit, so, so no other, one else will lend to you in the future. Well, yeah. So the other thing that he was he was going why he was saying it wasn't theft. Um, it wasn't like so that collectors couldn't keep tracking you down to see if you would later acquire this property to give back or to give as per your contract. The idea was is that they couldn't put you in a, in a prison for theft. A debtor's prison. This was a case against debtor's prison. That's what I left out of my original thing. Introduction. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense now, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it kind of changed my mind. And so I think debtor's prison is pretty evil. And, you know, if you borrow money and you give collateral, say you borrow money on a house, and then that house is only worth 10% or of what you paid for it, and the bank takes the house, should should they be able to come after you? I guess it all depends on the contract. It yeah, that, them, but it's, it's I don't two think there's of... anything to feel guilty about not paying a loan, a, a, a loan that is, a, you know, has collateral. And if, if they, the lender takes the collateral, I think that's... Well, I think you know, we have to look yeah, at this, too, in terms of where. personal responsibility. So uh, when someone agrees to loan you money, and if we're talking about a free society, they the reason that they charge interest is because they're taking risks. They are accepting the risk that they might not get it back, that you might default, that might possibly happen. That's that's in the cards of the contract that, hey, you know, you, you I'm, I can't send guys to come and beat you up. I mean, that's not literally yeah. in the contract. But they can't send people to beat you up because... Unless it's in the contract. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, so when you finish, that's what credit I, I is for. Else. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But but that's what credit is for. You know, you loan to somebody and they, they don't pay you back for whatever reason, either because they're stiffing you or because they, they're a horrible businessman and their plan didn't pan out. Or they well, got hit by a truck. Or, well, if they get hit by a truck, I guess it's not their, biz, their, their fault. But when you look at it, it's that's what... That's what professional relationships are for no one else is going to lend to that guy in the future for whatever reason because he doesn't pay back his loans and until he pays back his loan then you know th- he's not going to get another one well and that exists today i mean that's what the whole credit rating agency thing is about that would exist in an anarchical society but you brought up an interesting point with the violence and that's that's what i want to um 
get into. What if you do have the money and you are stiffing somebody? Um, now the property exists, and I guess well, you have stolen it. Well, I mean, so, I've, had, I've had a friend um, who just said, uh, <laughs> "I'm not fuck you, I'm not paying you." Yeah, and they have the money. I, I guess it would be perfectly acceptable to just go and take it at that. Point. Well, it depends. Or to hire uh, somebody to go and take it. Uh, they oh, agreed to give you the money. They're that would seem to their, violate the NAP. And, yeah, I mean, because by that. They've, they violated it by stealing from you. Right, but by that right, you've just justified government because someone stole my laptop. I have a right to appeal someone else. No, to he's not go saying he's saying to hire someone. Laptop. I don't think yeah. it's the well, same thing. It, I mean, it's it's still you have to initiate violence. If 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 you're saying are you that initiating violence, initiating or did the other person initiate by stealing? Well, it's two separate events. Place. I mean, you you acknowledge that you can lose money by lending it, and if the guy stiffs you, you just never lend him again. The whole point of lending is taking in account people's risks and saying, well, he's a good risk, he's a bad risk. And if you loan to someone as a good enough people that are a good risk, it's going to make up for the few flunkies. So that's but that seems to be ignoring collateral. But of course, yeah, you have yeah, collateral. If you're going to take collateral, that's, that could kind of be an act of violence. If somebody decides that they're not willing to give you the collateral they agreed to give you, that's no different than them not giving you the money they agreed to give you. That, that That's, a, I think, a little different because the money, if you don't have collateral in the contract, you, you can't go and just take the money from them. You know, that's just goes on their credit. But what if they are in, intentionally not paying you back? Yeah. Maybe they, I'm and, saying they uh, have That would money. be, if, if they are doing it, as a fraud, then I would say fraud is theft, and yeah. Well, I would, I would argue that, that it is and theft, but we can't really but stop theft is every single act of aggression in the world. You know, we can't look at this like a utopian well, society. You would need even well, what would be the 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 moral recourse if you're going to have an, if you're going to have a contract like this. I would argue that the smart thing to do would be have insurance in case it does fuck up. And that, that is a possibility. That's yeah, what's... you know what? David Friedman goes into this pretty heavily. He come, like, That's the second time he's come up in our discussion. So in order to... You, you wouldn't go into one of these agreements with somebody unless they're insured and if they're stiffing people. Well, not they, necessarily. Modern, but I mean, it's also reputation. There's a lot of... Yeah. Modern credit cards operate under the assumption that they can't get back what you spend your credit card on. Yeah. So, the insurance is built into the credit card, but the interest rate. Right. And on top of it, if you do default, I'm assuming they already have uh, some type of hedging system or insurance system in play to yeah. options. They probably have options all over the place. Right. Um, to that end, I don't think the uh, credit card companies really ever lose out unless there's a massive default. Yeah. Like, well, like when the economy crashes. Are we moving yeah. towards a, a debtor's Prison type of a. We've already society. had it with taxes. You, you know, I actually, I, I don't I consider taxes interesting... to be a debt. No, but they put you into a debtor's prison for not paying. They create a fictitious S- debt. Yeah, it's really like that. But that's interesting what you brought up. I, I was associating with a, a group of people. I, I actually meet up with them Thursdays. So we have this group it's called Escape the Financial Matrix. Have you heard of Orrin Woodward? I think it is. I have. Not. Um, he started the the what, what was it called? Financial. Freedom. Financial Freedom oh. Network? I, I can't remember. It was like Team Freedom or something. I, oh. I can't remember the exact name of it. Um, but I've been associated with these guys. I've been trying to network with them a little bit. They've actually been trying to recruit me to work with them. Probably not going to happen because I'm not interested in selling books. But that's it's actually exactly what they talk about. What they, they bring up is the fact that a majority of people are actually trapped in debt. I'm not just on an individual level, but the very fact that they... they I'm actually really glad that this company has a very libertarian leaning uh mindset so the books they sell are all about how the financial system is rigged against you the way that the the government creates money out of thin air lends it to the bank that which then or gives it to the bank and then the bank lends it back to the government and every inch of our tax stuff yeah and every inch of our tax dollars really just going off to pay existing debt we're we're in debt nationally federal or nationally in the state, we're in debt. As local citizens, we're all just trapped in one big debt. And it's a mindset is their argument. They're saying this, that we're taught from a young age that we're supposed to go to college and spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then as soon as we're out, we're supposed to take out a mortgage on a house we can't afford. We're supposed to get a car. And we're supposed to live and pay off our debt and then die at the ripe old age of 90 with nothing to our name. And what they're trying to do is Except educate people. <laughs> 
to break out of the debt cycle by just not taking on debt and just buying things with their own money and just living well, that's within really, their means. That's that's a nice idea, but it's extremely hard to do. I mean, mm-hmm. if you if you're making forty grand a year and you want to buy a house within, let's say, your budget, the houses you'd be looking at are they're squalor or they're really far, far away from anything that you know. I was looking at a house in Grayling today. $37,000. It was a nice cabin. But I was saying, like, well, I could afford that, and I could pay it off very quickly. But Grayling to Pontiac is, I don't know how many fucking... Three, three hours. Yeah. I'm saying, yeah. like, I'm not driving three hours to get to my house and then drive another... Like, I would have no time to do that. The fact is, our current economy... It is, it is rigged against us. I would argue, though, it's not necessarily on purpose. It's kind of a, it's kind of what happened I would when disagree with that well if you look at a when we went off the gold standard finally in 1971 um, the only other implication for not printing money would be to assume money is debt which would be technically a, a leash on gov- on spending right if you you would think that they would have an incentive not to go too far into not to spend too much because then it would create the um, the corresponding we debt. Ever really well, they don't care stuff. about the yeah, debt I because know that. they don't have to deal with it. It's the next generation. Oh, I know that, but that's that's the way I see it. It was like they went from gold, gold equaling cash, and then they said, well, we need some type of restraint. We may as well just make it debt rather than just having no restraint and just calling it money and printing it to shit and back. Well, we were never really on the gold it's, standard. It's not even really a debt either. It's just a method of distributing funds from the Federal All Reserve money to, is the, debt. to the... Um, yeah, every dollar society. ever printed no, is, a, is a debt owed it, to the it, Federal it's, Reserve. It's not really it's a debt, though. It, it doesn't fit the definition of a debt. Well, it, it is, because any, every dollar they print, they it, loan. No, it's, a loan. Yeah, well, it is it's, true. It's because, not. Let me finish. Okay, you, go ahead and finish. What they do is they print dollars at the Federal Reserve digitally or on paper. They use the money to well, buy... Treasury prints it on paper. The Federal Reserve... The hires the treasury yeah. to print it for them. Yeah. It's, it's the Fed's money. They print the money or they they put it in ones and zeros and they use it to buy bonds. Treasury bills. From the government. Which is which, a debt instrument. Which no. is a debt instrument. Yeah, so, so it's it a loan. Seems, Every dollar. Listen, no, no. I'm not done. Sorry. <laughs> so great, it seems like it's a debt because they've bought a debt instrument. They have a debt on their books. With and interest. With interest. And at, at that point, it appears like it's a debt. But there's two other things. One, they have to return the interest to the Treasury at the end of the year. Not all. Yeah. Well, they take some out for their, their fees. But for the most part, the interest is... But the T-bills are only probably a small percentage of what they actually print. Most of the money they print, they loan to banks. The loan no, 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 they, they, the, the loaning to the bank thing is, is relatively new, um, with the, um, the, this past downturn in the economy. But for the most part, they buy government, um, bonds with it. And they've, they've, you said T bills. They've also recently bought some other longer term stuff. But they buy these debt instruments, they return the interest, and the government can infinitely turn them over. So in other words, the government never has to pay them back, and they don't have to pay interest on them. It's not debt. It's so you're just saying way, it's, it's fake debt in order to debt. infinitely print. Yeah. Uh, but the, it's just the, a mechanism for getting the money out into the economy because the Federal Reserve just makes money. It doesn't have spending capabilities it to does. get I don't, I don't, I don't believe, believe you yeah, but I mean it doesn't so, it doesn't like have to, all these well maybe that's something we should research before your next meeting yeah I would like to you yeah. know I would like you to after this uh, talk to give me uh, information where you got that because that's not my understanding at all my understanding is that every dollar that the federal reserve you know, that's, makes that's, is a loan. That's because well, that's what everybody says on Facebook. And well, no, because, I didn't read this in Facebook. And, and, and because... 30 years ago, long and, before Facebook was... Well, started. and because of the process that I described where they actually buy debt instruments that 
makes it appear to be a loan, but as soon as you put in the part where they have to return the interest at the end of the year and the government can infinitely roll over the debt, that's not a debt because they don't have to pay it back and they don't have to pay interest. I don't think that the the T bills are a very large well, part. But it does create no, a large T-bill problem is, is with what the, they buy. It does the primary thing that they buy. Almost everything that the Fed buys is a T bill. Well well but keep in what mind all the banks Borrow all their money from yes. That that's the actually Fed. one they, major they're borrowing problem. a tiny bit of money from the Fed, and that's they a borrow new, all their money. No, they don't. With the with the fractional reserve system, how they can lend out more money than they have, that creates a huge inflationary effect. So what happens is we you know we print this money, we give it to the Federal Reserve. We let's say we write a check to the Federal Reserve for a hundred thousand dollars, right? The Federal Reserve can then go out and lend a million total. So they lend 100000 to the U.S. and say, here's your money. Now they have $900,000 to loan to the rest of the banks. They lend out that $900,000, and then each, but it's broken up. Now, each individual bank that has $100,000 can now go out and lend more than they have. So it creates this, this, this duplicating effect of inflation, where it creates a huge spike on in the inflation that the economy goes through. It's horrible. Well, it's a Ponzi scheme at the end of the day. That's what well, really I wouldn't call to. that a Ponzi scheme, but the reason the way the fractional more... reserve here's the way fractional reserve banking works. You deposit a hundred dollars in the bank. The bank well, can loan 90. out like ninety dollars of it. So no, they person, can loan out no, ten no, times of it. No, 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 yep. no, no. They the, can't. The current system. They I'm can't. doing a step by step process okay. here that explains <laughs> it. I. So you deposit a hundred dollars in the bank. The bank can loan out, say, ninety dollars. Um, <clears throat> somebody receives that ninety dollars, deposits it in the bank. The bank can loan out maybe eighty dollars of that. If somebody gets that eighty dollars. They deposit the eighty dollars in the bank, and so on and so on and so on. There is a formula for calculating what the multiplier effect is. Um, for a given reserve requirement um, in, in a fractional reserve system, there's nothing sinister about it. It's just a matter of the, the money getting loaned out and then being redeposited in the bank yeah, over and over and over again until you run out. And It's unsustainable. That, that, that's the way that it works. I, and it's a limited amount of lending that can happen. And there's so much mythology and folklore in the anarchist and in, in well, libertarian like community about this, when the reality is it's just a it's just a process. People say they can lend out multiple times of what what is originally created. Well, that's what they're effectively. Well, doing. that's effectively that what they're the doing. Told me that that they can loan out. A no, no, no. About they can only loan out a certain percentage of their profits of their deposits, and it's less than what they have on deposit. Yeah, it's a thousand it's percent. A, that's what the no, no, no. It's less than a hundred percent. That's the fractional reserve. If the reserve requirement is ten percent, then they can loan out ninety percent, and that's it. Not a thousand percent. You can't you can't loan out something that you don't have. No, but uh, effectively. But what he's. I thought they borrowed all that money from the Federal Reserve. No, I need to research no. this, but we might not be. Uh, yeah, I do have a master's degree in finance with a specialization in financial services. I should point that out. I Look, know. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I respect you, Joe. But <laughs> I don't respect the, someone that would say that necessarily, Joe. Yeah, but effectively, the fact that they can keep multiplying with this lending. Is equivalent to lending out maybe a thousand dollars or so, just based on the initial hundred dollars. As long as they can keep extending out further and further, right? There's a limit to how far they can extend it out, though. That's why I said there's a formula to to calculate the multiplier effect depending on what the reserve requirement is. I had a, but even then, every time there's a reserve, it cuts back. I had a amount. person that owned a bank who told several of us at a Bitcoin meetup and he didn't want to answer it at right at first, but he said that they can, the 10% is that they can loan out 10 times as much as they, they have as on deposit. That's what he said. He's talking about leverage. Yeah. So should, uh, he's not talking about what they have on deposit. He's saying what they have as assets. He's levered 10 to one. There's ten dollars worth of equity in the bank, and he's allowed to loan out ten times that. That's what he's talking about. 
Oh, uh, you'll have to explain it to me. Yeah. At another time. <laughs> Well, he's it, it, basically if he's he he's on the hook for ten dollars, but he has what ninety dollars in uh, hopefully money that's returned to him. That's why he's so levered up. Yeah, he's completely dependent on. He's loaning borrowed money. Right. So let's say you have ten dollars, and then you borrow a hundred dollars, and then you lend out. A um, hundred dollars. Well, you've lent out ten times what you have. You're you're levered up. Another example of leverage is let's say you're a, pro, a real estate investor, and you borrow eighty percent of the value of a, um, let's say you buy a house and you're going to rent it out. You're levered five to one on that house because. Um, you have five times as much assets as equity. Yeah. So you have twenty thousand. Let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar house that you're buying to to lend out, and you put twenty thousand dollars down on it, and you borrow eighty thousand dollars. You are levered five to one. It's you, four to one. Or, or, yeah, it's four to one. Yeah. I mean, but aren't you, you four uh, one. allowed to consider um, the uh, the real estate as part of the assets? The value of the real estate. So, so yeah, so as the assets it generates money. The assets are are a hundred thousand dollars, but the debt is eighty thousand dollars. So your equity in it is still twenty thousand dollars. So it's four to one. Um, is what you're levered. So what that means in, in terms of leverage is if the value of the property goes down by twenty percent, you are wiped out. Yep. You have no equity left. In your investment. So this is why when they talk about banks being levered up ten to one, it's a um, it's a risk because now only ten percent of the value of their um, portfolio is equity, and if it goes down ten percent in value, they're completely wiped out. Yep. And these banks during you know during the crisis they they got their leverage ratio was way higher than that it was some of them were like um they would have like three percent equity yeah um, or even zero yeah which which would happen because as it goes down in value your leverage ratio goes up so like if you buy, if you put the twenty thousand down like i said and then the value falls to eighty five thousand well now you have eighty thousand dollars of the debt and five thousand dollars of equity your leverage ratio goes up as the value of the underlying asset goes down. That's what they're talking about when they say you can lend out 10 to 1. I'll have to look into that. Your thoughts, Ken? I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I basically listen. don't believe anything anybody says as soon as they say it because, I mean, I'm not, I don't disbelieve you, but yeah. I'm not going to... skeptical. Yeah, you got to be skeptical because when somebody says something, it's like that could be true in their paradigm, but it, it's not necessarily true. And I respect you. And well, I think the one pretty that's, good chance it's true, but I, that's completely against what I have thought for a long time. So that's I'd have one to thing look I look into that before I could say that I agree with you or I believe you or whatever. This is why I'm very critical of um, a lot of the conspiratards and anti-vaxxers <laughs> and sky. Uh, they tend to rely on antecedent evidence, right? Or anecdotal, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Antecedental and uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, so when I hear a personal testament, like oh, there was eyewitness accounts at the um, twin towers, like the base charges blew before the the, the plane even hit the building. I sit there, kind of like, well, they've done a number of studies that show that eyewitness accounts are completely unreliable. Um. Memories can be modified, right. aug, aug, augmented. And yet not They've one finished s- study on the 9-11 collapsing, just saying. Well, what's that? They, not one conclusive study on 9-11 collapsing, just, or the, the buildings collapsing. I mean, they have conflicting reports, reports that didn't even test for explosives. The fact is, even without the eyewitness testimony, I'm not saying that government's behind it. You can't really say something unless you have evidence for that first. I don't think any of the stories about 9-11, whether they're from the truthers or the government, 
are um, sufficient uh, sufficient evidence behind them to say that they're believable. Right. But but that's the thing. A lot of the truthers aren't coming up with a story. They're saying that your story is bullshit, and we just want like a real yeah uh, a real investigation. I'm, that's I'm all fine. we want. Unfortunately, yeah. I don't have the luxury of what a lot of truthers or conspiracy theorists or religious people or whatever. I don't have the luxury to just believe something. I, I really but need the truthers evidence. aren't believing something. They're saying is we don't believe something because there's no the the official story has inconclusive reports, conflicting reports that never tested for explosives, never tested for, you know, oh the, the beams bowed outward. No, they bowed inward bowed inward. It's just so conflicting that the stories don't make sense. So I don't think that it, it's coming up with a theory to say I don't think that makes any sense. Why don't we get a full investigation? Of course it's too really too late for that, but well, I think the, in my mind, the first two towers, it makes a lot of sense that they would collapse like that. It, as far as the other one, that's kind of weird, but I don't well, really I know. Well, I mean, if you look at, if you but ask... But I thought the truthers kind of believe that it's a government setup. Well, if you ask the testimony of de demolitions experts and architects, they'll tell you that, that that should not fall that way. It's physically impossible. Well, there's other experts that would disagree. Yeah. But, but who? Who, who? Who can I'm, disagree with physics? What expert. can fall... At free fall speed, with mass underneath it, the mass just evaporates underneath it. Instantly. Well, no, it was boom, 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 boom. But it didn't happen. It came like this. Yeah, it didn't. Like a, it didn't pause. It didn't fall sideways. It came straight down. Yeah, it's no, like each it floor. Hit, 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 but it fell at free fall speed, as in no resistance. No, there was resistance. I don't know. They, they measured it. It's free fall. You speed. can't have free fall speed in a in a non vacuum. I'm sorry. We don't live in a vacuum environment. There's I'm air just gas saying, and there's you, air pressure. This, 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 when they out. say freeze fall, they meant there was no resistance underneath it. There's there still there's, resistance. It didn't, well, beyond air. We, you, I'm sure they You know what air. they're talking about. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't. I just find it technically, from a technical standpoint, to be a bit misleading to say free well, fall when free fall actually applies to um, a vacuum situation, not something that has gas between layers but when they say free fall all they're saying is is that it fell without anything underneath it stopping it from falling it didn't fall a little bit and then stop it didn't fall slowly and this pancake I mean, effect what is the what is the time that it takes to smash something right below it it could be just that, that noise that you just made <laughs> you know but, that but could it came be the speed almost that's... instantly and if, if you look there have been way worse fires than what happened in the Twin yeah, Towers. Yeah, well, there was like 15, what, 10 floors or 15 floors above it. So that way, when, if if you take 10 or 15 f floors Millions and drop them 10 feet, feet or 12 feet, whatever a, a single story is, if you drop that much weight, 12 feet, it's going to crush the one below it. And then that's going to crush the one below it, and it's going to go... But it's going to have an effect. It's going to take time. It's uh, crush, crush, know. crush, crush. Not that much time. Well, I mean, I mean, I've had a little bit of demolition experience, so it makes sense in my mind. But I'm not a, I'm not a well, and, expert and, like on that. Like you mentioned, Building Seven. I don't think we which was uh, barely even on fire when it. But my out. point is, is that I don't have the information. I think Danny was saying the same yeah. thing. We don't really have the information to say that what happened. And I, That's my impression is, is that the truthers have a lot of. It just doesn't make sense. Seem to have their own theories that they like believe. I don't really. Well, I, I got I a question disbelieve. for you. I got a question for you. Where, okay, never in history has a plane completely disintegrated into nothingness. I mean, engine blocks are huge. They don't just disintegrate. Where is the plane that landed or crashed in Pennsylvania? Where are the pieces of the plane that crashed into the Pentagon? In fact, where is any video evidence? I mean, the most secure building, what's supposed to be the most secure building in the United States, maybe beside the White House, and there's not a single camera that caught this this massive plane hitting, and and it leaves a hole this big. You figure if wings hit that building, I mean, even if the the wings disintegrated when it hit, it would have caused damage to the building. But no, there's kind of no damage. Yeah. But it's just a hole, just a hole that's smaller than the damn plane. So I'm not saying I know what happened, but it doesn't make any fucking sense. And that's all the the truth movement really says is, hey. That story doesn't make sense. It shouldn't fall like that. Where's the video footage? What is, what's going on here? And then the government's like, well, we can't test the metal. We sold it to, to another country. Sorry. You know, it's... it's <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that's fine if that's where you're coming from, from the truth movement. I, I would kind of, I kind of side with I wouldn't with disagree that. with that. But yeah. um, what he's talking about is stuff that we see from individuals. There, like chemtrails. There, there's all kinds of truthers on the internet who think they know exactly what happened, and they put forth this theory like like it's a fact, and there's zero evidence to support whatever. Or not even It's not even if it's zero evidence. Or, it's or just evidence they, that's hard to... Oh, yeah. Anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal yeah. or, or, yeah, limited. There's insufficient evidence, we'll say that, just, just to be concrete. There's definitely insufficient evidence to support any theory as to what happened that day. I've, that, that's the way I see it. I've had memories that I had about a certain person that I worked with, and then 10 years later, 12 years later, another person reminds me of that memory and it was this a different person than I had remembered it with. So I know I have firsthand experience with remembering the wrong thing with false memories in my own self. So well, there are a lot of false memories and yeah, a lot of this stuff. And, like deja vu for example is is yeah, like just, people will sit there and say, "Well, I, I've done this before. I know I have, but the event has never taken place before." There's actually you can go ahead. Oh, I watched a TED talk on this specific event that made the claim what event? that oh 9-11 that made the claim that nobody saw the second tower fall live or even recently after it fell on TV because the footage didn't come out until sometime later and then they said after 10 years like everybody in America like put the two events together in real time and then remember seeing it in real time like a half an hour apart. That was the claim by this TED Talk. They said the footage wasn't on the news. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, I thought it was. I was actually... Well, that's what, you? well, no, it happened a half an hour apart. What they're saying is is that you didn't see it that way because it wasn't you on remember yet. seeing it that way because that's how it actually was. And you've been told over and over again that that's how it was. And I don't know. It's weird. I don't know if it's true. That's what the guy said in the TED Talk, but I thought it was interesting. I, I was actually going to answer you. Uh, the theories on the, the whole deja vu situation is that the there's a delay in your subconscious and conscious thought. So they, they, what they say is you almost have two different memories. So when you're saying, oh, my God, I saw this before, what well, you did in a nanosecond ago, and what you're doing is you're, you're, you're seeing it in your subconscious mind. Uh, before you see it in your conscious mind. So you, you are remembering something. Because everything we see actually happens point, I don't even know the exact math, like point zero 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 one of a second before we actually It's a fraction it before it hits our brain. Yeah. Right. So what, the, what it is, is you're, it is actually in the past. You are actually remembering it. It just seems like real time to us because we're just accustomed to seeing the world in the past. That's interesting. Well, um... But again, I'm not a scientist. Well, That's just no, I, a theory on it. I've I've heard um, I've read up on it a little bit. Uh, the one thing I, one of the theories I remember reading was there are maybe situations that are reminiscent, and then we just kind of a part of our brain misfires and augments and says, "Oh yeah, we did this before," and that's why we experience. Um, Deja vu. Uh, that's a plausible theory. I have no dis. Uh, the thing is, deja vu is hard to a prove. B um, give a strong explanation of. Well, it's definitely not something that you can uh, reproduce in studies. Right. I mean, it just happens when it happens. But my my larger point is that memories and thoughts about the past um, can be easily. Uh, manipulated, they're faulty. Um, like if you look at people with dementia and they start remembering shit from, they see maybe their kid's face, but then they start thinking about their grandfather and that you can't communicate with them. Human memory is an 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 anecdotal. Anecdotal. Yes, evidence is. Um, it, it. I would just. I tend to filled. dismiss it. On the whole, if I it's want, extraordinarily flawed. Yeah, even, done a little, uh, even when people are very confident in what they remember, they could be remembering something completely wrong. Yeah, I did a 
I've read part of a book called The Believing Brain, and there's just a lot of scientific reasons for why you just believe shit that isn't even true. Like, one thing, like, with, you know, your mind has to come up with a story just to, to make sense of what you're seeing. Sometimes you can't understand what you think, so your mind will just like come up with supporters. something. Yeah. You know, actually, this, this, this yeah, this opens Your up. Your mind just fills in the blanks, and <laughs> yeah, this opens up a wide topic. And this, this almost came up in, a, in one of our earlier episodes. Um, we could really use some research into what it is that causes people to believe these things, and then trust, and then also what can be done to help people unlearn wrong stuff well and i I mean i would argue and god i wish katie were here um i've done a little bit of sleuthing through psychology lately and um one factor is trust we tend to rely on our parents when we're at a young age to give us proper proper information now if our parents are giving us bad information let's say jesus exists um (laughs) Then Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> then we are we tend to believe what they believe, even though yeah. there's really not a lot of strong evidence supporting Jesus' existence. Um, and the other factor I would argue is that we aren't really taught as a, as a society, and um, not just the United States, but like I guess humankind in general. Maybe the Japanese have a better grip on it than the rest of us, but we aren't really taught to think um, objectively about things like detach emotion from. Um, I don't think we know how to think objectively. It's not part of our genetic. It's not part well, no, of our because, evolutionary makeup. Well, no, it is. The problem is, you have three stages of the brain. You have the um, reptilian million, and then um, uh, oh god, the neocortex, which is <laughs> reptilians. Which is unique to kind of, I think... It, our, when he talks about the reptilian brain, the reason it's called that is because it we evolved... Have in with reptiles. No, no, it, it, we, it, we do have in common with reptiles, but it evolved when reptiles evolved. Right, and the evolved. reptilian brain responds uh, to instinct. The mammalian brain tends to respond to emotion, and it's only, I, th- I think it's really only within, like, some species of um, it's somebody's phone vibrating. Only a few species of mammals have like something of a neocortex where they they can actually start to think about things. Lizards don't really think; they just react. Um, chimps can kind of think. You can kind of see like they develop primitive tools, but in large measure, if you watch their behavior, they tend to be kind of emotional. They respond to everything in either fear or aggression. And a lot of humans, I would argue, are still kind of stuck, not to be mean, but <laughs> they're kind of stuck in that, like, oh, I'm going to respond to this emotionally rather than subtract myself and then look at things as if I'm not really, as if I have no vested interest well, in well, it. But, yeah. Is- I wanted to actually build on the first thing you said, though, um, where you said how, how the Jesus is real thing. Studies have shown that kids who are lied to, even simple white lies or whatever as children, and believe in Santa Claus and whatever, tend to be more, tend to be more likely to believe falsehoods in the future. They're more gullible. I've I've always said this for forever, Mm -hmm. probably since before you were born, that Jesus and the Easter, I mean, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny are just primers for religion. They're just... Yeah, get them to believe in Santa Claus, and they'll believe in God and Jesus. And and so, do, do you have? Um, do you sorry. remember any kind of source behind this? We could throw in the show notes. I, I do. You know? I don't remember where I read it. It's, it's, you just have to look it up All and right. see where you find, you find be, it. You could define. Um, yeah. And then on the second part, it's really just comes through evolutionary traits. You know, we're humans. We're still we're young species in general. You know, so when you look at. Uh, when we're surviving in like a hunter gatherer state, when we see a lion, we didn't really have time to set ourselves back and ponder whether or not this lion was friendly or not. Right. It was attack the yeah. lion or run like hell or hide. The fear has to act. And fear has what is what allowed us to get this point in our evolutionary chain. To an extent. 
Right. Yeah. But the problem was is that fear is still ingrained in us and we don't necessarily need it as much as we used to because there aren't lions hiding around every corner. And fear right. makes us lose logic in a sense. We don't so, But we have false um, but like I've uh that uh, the believing brain that I uh, was reading, they really go into that quite in depth quite a bit where you know, you make your brain makes connections and if you have like false positives, so say you're walking through the jungle and you hear a noise and you, you you hide or run because you think it might be a predator well that that could be a false positive but if you have a false negative at that then point you're say you're going <laughs> to get eaten so all the people that had the false negatives all the time got eaten so I think right. people tend to make connections too much that's why people that are, are insane are so close to artists or, or geniuses like um, Tesla. He was crazy as fuck, but he might be the smartest guy ever. No, he's a little bit crazy. But he might be one of the, the, the most brilliant minds ever. He, he's got a point, though. A lot of smart people are crazy. If you even look but, at it. but it's these false you know, connections. You know, you make connections between this noise, like um, you know, you're at a gas station, you see somebody talking on a phone, and then he looks at you, and you think he's talking about you. That could be a real, you know, maybe he real, really is talking about you, or maybe you just see that. And I see that with, so, so I think a lot of conspiracy theorists tend to, like, put a lot of, uh, have a lot of, you know, false connections. And, you know, so that's that's where a lot of that well, crazy beliefs come from is it's kind of evolutionary, like you're saying. If you're but it's, here, also, you know. it's also an emotional response. It's not necessarily well, a logical We are response. emotional computers. That's how our brain works. <laughs> okay, though. We really do. I think part of it has to do with groupthink, too, because oh, people are horrible. more likely to believe something if the group believes in it. They just assume oh, that it must be right. I work in a union job, and it's like, I just, I, I've been 20, 30 people against me. It's like. <laughs> I watched a video, and it wasn't by any means, I don't think, a scientific study, but it was still interesting. It showed a group of people sitting in a doctor's office, and what happened is they had a bell that would ding. Oh, I yes. saw that. So every time the bell would ding, like five that. people would stand up, yeah. and they'd sit down. I'll and this one lady who wasn't a part of this was like, what the hell? And after them doing it about five or six times, she started doing it with them. <laughs> and then they started taking people out of the room one by one. And so she was the only one there, and then she kept doing it. By herself, yeah. <laughs> yep. Somebody else came in and sat down, and he was, and he was again, not part of the, the plan. And then the, the other lady started sitting up, and he's like, what are you doing? She's like, I don't know. Everyone else is doing it. She, so now they are both start doing it, and every new person who comes in starts doing yeah, it. Yeah, I've heard of studies and like that, not that exact one. But I've heard of, there are actually studies like that, or they've used, like, it Monkeys might even be a scientific study. No, I don't know. I'm not going to source it as scientific because it, it would seem more interesting. No, I have read you. about. I have read about scientific studies where they actually did that, literally. One, one thing I was going to say about the um, the whole three brain thing is that all three brains still exist in your um, in your mind um, physically, and the more primitive brains are faster. And that's that's what you're you're going at. Um, there's a process called amygdala amygdala hijack, um, and I was reading about this in a book, and I was looking over here trying to figure out if I could remember what the book was. Um, but it was about um, breaking through to people, um, and he gave examples of like talking to people who were um, like about to kill themselves and stuff like that in this book. It was a psychological. But, um, I'll see if I can find it and throw it in the show notes after. But, um, the point was, when you get into a tense situation, your more primitive brains take over, and your um, cortex just shuts down. Well, I think another thing that happens is, like, what Danny was talking about with the emotional um, brain... That brain fires first, and then sometimes your neocortex will try to come up with a reason to justify why you feel that way. I actually, I can Yeah. I'm in sales. So that's one of the things they teach you is when you sell to someone, you sell them on emotions first, and then you have to give them facts with it so that they are able to justify it later. So, yeah. well, so that's why we don't say things like, 
well, you can buy this life insurance value, that a policy that will grow cash value. We pay out dividends. They don't care about that. You say, well, you need to buy this policy because, you know, if something happens to your family, we want to make sure that they're taken care of. And they go, oh, yeah, they do. And then while we're explaining that, we point out the dividends and all the things so that later when when their family goes, why don't you buy this? Well, it pays dividends. Look at this. So they, they're able to justify it um, right. after the fact. Yeah. yeah. Most decisions are made emotionally, but, you know, one thing that's, kind of really blew me away what I learned about it was confirmation bias and I think that is the the what? biggest thing about why people believe what they believe is because if you if and I see anarchists libertarians are, are of guilty of the same thing it, and I think it's I don't think you have time to logically consider all the options and and figure out every single thing that you hear throughout the day you you hear ten thousand different things throughout the day you don't have time you can file it away and say okay yeah that that goes along with this and that's what it is and then you just rationalize it to fit into that you rationalize everything that you think about you rationalize to fit into what you to, to what you believe like what you were saying earlier the about, about the you know the um, fractional reserve oh that doesn't really make sense to me. Now, it could be true, but I don't have time to sit there and logically research it while we're sitting here talking. And I'm not going to call you a liar, but I'm not going to believe you either. You know what I mean? It's like, well, well that's to, also part that's of the reason why. But I most threw... people are going to, but all people are going to like, well, that doesn't fit with my way of thinking or that does fit with my way of thinking. And then they're going to rationalize anything you hear. You basically just rationalize it to fit into your way of thinking.